everybody here. Um, please be welcome to uh, this fantastic kid here. I learned a lot from him, even though he's only since two years playing around with uh, iOS. Uh, I mentioned as well the first untethering case that I had with my iPhone was something like, like with iOS 5.1. And with every update, you had to do the whole shebang again, of course. That's what I remember. So, please uh, give a warm welcome here to little Lilo. I spell this correctly? Yeah. Yes. Um, little Lilo is uh, really a very fascinating geek. He uh, actually hacks any kind of OS device, to my opinion. Any kind of, huh? Yeah. So, throw it to him and it comes back in pieces. He's as sharp as a knife. <laughs> Please give him a warm wel welcoming applause. We're going to untether iOS. Yay! Okay. So, yeah, I'm the Lilo, as already introduced. Um, I'm interested in IT security in general, and I started to look into iOS about two years ago. And then um, I met three awesome guys, Zigusa, Stack, and Ivy Sparks, and we basically started to chat a lot, and in the end also released the jailbreak me um, for iOS 10, on toil not spyware at all. So for everybody who isn't familiar with the jailbreak scene, um, it's like rooting on Android, so it basically is a tool that gives the user uh, the capability to um, yeah, tweak their device, and that's mostly done by basically installing a jailbreak. In this case, you just go to a website and then slide there and it will install a package manager on your phone. And then the end user can install tweaks, so just little dynamic libraries. And they get injected into all the other system processes and then they can obviously modify their memory. And that, for example, allows customization of the home screen or something like that. And basically with the release, we also formed the team, the Jake Player for 20 team. And it was created and with the Twitter account and there are also a few demos there if you want to check it out after the talk. And yeah, I basically had this pipe dream that in my life I really want to achieve an untethered jailbreak using only some sort of plist or other safe file corruptions. So um, basically there are different kinds of jailbreaks. Um, in modern jailbreak the most common kind are semi-untethered, which means that the user has to connect their device to a PC um, when they first install the jailbreak and then they sideload an app onto the device so it in just installs itself there and then on each reboot the user has to go into the app and press a button to jailbreak the phone um, and Basically, after they reboot, they lose the jailbreak and have to go through this process again. And with an untethered jailbreak, um, you, the jailbreak gains persistent on installation, and then they will automatically um, jailbreak the device on each boot. So the device already jailbreaks, um, jailbroke, uh, boots jailbroke. So yeah, um, the untethered can be divided into four stages. In the first stage, um, that's the config file or database stage. I will go over how we gain execution of the boot. Then the config parser bug that um, gives us the right repair primitive. And then um, I will talk about the main bug, the ASLR bypass, which allows us to get into uh, ROP. Then stage two is um, basically a kernel exploit and completely written in ROP. Um, and there I will go over the two main kernel bugs, so the KSLR leak, and then the RACI double free we use to get the um, kernel read write. And I will also talk about the KSLR weakness um, and the root domain user client memory leak which aided us in exploitation. And after we get um, kernel read write, we can remove a few restrictions from Apple. Um, mainly, uh, we can bypass code signing, and that gives us the ability to load an unsigned dynamic library into our process. Um, so now, in stage three, we are basically in C um, via a dynamic library. And there, we are um, stashing the kernel task port to host special port four. So um, iOS has this concept of ports, um, task ports. And basically, if you have a send write to a task port of a process, you can read and write its memory. They are most used um, for uh, inter-process communication, basically. And where well, modern jailbreaks usually uh, stash the kernel task port into a special port 4, so that other user mode applications can then um, retrieve it, and with that, retrieve the send write, and then they can just read and write process memory. And after that, I just fix up everything, and then spawn stage 4, 
and that's basically running in a separate process that has a few advantages I will go into later and um, it's basically performing the whole post-exploitation process including launching substrate, um, the framework that's used for tweak injection and then performing LU restart um, to restart all the launch demons on the system and inject the tweaks into them. So yeah, in stage one uh, we basically need to get execution after boot and when iOS boots launch D is the first process that's running on the system and it basically then loads a dynamic library with a list of executables um, that are launch demons and there are a few flags um, associated with them and if the run and load flag is set um, launch D will then spawn all of those launch demons um, afterwards and we basically just attack one of those launch demons um, namely raccoon so uh, what is Raccoon? Basically Raccoon is part of the IPsec package um, uh, and it's a VPN client used to interact with um, an IP, um, IPsec VPN server and um, the problem uh, is though that the IPsec tools uh, project has been abandoned since 2014 so they officially here state on their website that the development of the project has been abandoned and that IP tools has security issues and you should not use it. Um, Apple still decided uh, it was a good idea to ship it after 2014 and they now maintain their own fork uh, on opensource.wl.com. And yeah, basically the only thing that's important for the talk um, is that Raccoon has a configuration parser. Um, so on startup it will just look for a file on disk and start to parse that. Um, and that's written in YAC, so completely written in C. So memory corruption might become a problem, and it actually is a problem, uh, as we can see with the config parser bug. And for that one, we have to go back a bit. Um, basically, in 2011, Poch2G released um, Corona for iOS 5, um, which was also an untethered. And there he used a bug in Raccoon in the configuration parser. And um, Poch2G um, found this one on an old bug tracker and basically the IPsec website had this bug tracker there where users could just report problems with their programs and one user in 2009 I think um, reported a bug that if he would use this specific config Raccoon would just sack fault but nobody looked at this for two years so in 2011 uh, Poch2G realized that this was actually exploitable and then used in a jailbreak and after that obviously Apple got aware of it and then they also said that they fixed it um, and it got a CVE, a signed CVE 2012 3727 um, and yeah they say that the issue was improved uh, through improved bounce checking, just for improved bounce checking. So let's look at the patch. That's the function before the patch, and that's the function after the patch. Um, and if this was too fast for you, here's the diff. So basically, there is no difference. The bug is still there, and Apple didn't patch it. Um, <laughs> What really happened here was that basically this is obviously a configuration parser, so um, uh, there are different statements that nearly do the same thing. Um, there are these DNS4 statements uh, to parse an IP address and there are wins for statement followed by an IP address and they, for both of them they have to parse the IP address. So um, the function for copying that, um, for parsing that was just copy pasted from another one and yeah basically Apple fixed the bug in the other function so um, which which I don't get because basically the engineer there had to look at it at the PUC uh, Poch2G provided then they had to realize okay the bug is in there fix it and then they had to recompile it and never test it against the original PUC because otherwise Raccoon would have crashed again um, yeah it's basically an off by one which allows you to overwrite the index of an array and um, Poch2G gave a talk about this and we can basically reuse his strategy from back in 2011 to get a right repair primitive. Um, so yeah, again, the vulnerable function. Here at the top um, you can see the yuck syntax, so an address wins list has to consist of either an address win statement or an address win statement followed by a comma followed by an address wins list. So um, that's a recursion, there can be multiple address win statements in a row. And then um, below that an address win statement is defined as containing an address string and that's just a regex to match an IP version 4 address and if the parser finds that it will run the code between those two brackets so um, they, they get a pointer to a global struct and then they check if this nvns4 index is bigger than maximum wins and if so they return an error um, the problem here is that this is the off by one it shouldn't be checking if it's greater than so uh, but it should be a check for greater or equal than max wins and after that they use this inner Python function to basically parse the address uh, which is in this variable into uh, the nbns4 
array at the n-4 index and then post increment the index and that will also become in handy when exploiting this bug. So yeah, how is exploitation done? Basically, there are here the globals, there's this LC config pointer in the globals pointing to a heap structure um, that the parser also uses and then there's this DNS4 array uh, followed by uh, the DNS array index and then the NBNS4 array followed by the NBNS4 array index. Um, so we can just use a mod CFG statement followed by this wins4 statement with the IP address to parse uh, the IP address in the first um, array element and we can repeat this process four times um, to then move the index out of bounds. So now it's pointed to itself and the cool thing is about about that is that they thought it would be a good idea to use integers for those array um, indexes instead of unsigned integers so we can just point them um, you just use a negative number to bypass the bounce check um, so yeah we will override it with minus one to point it to the DNS array index and then we use another win statement to override the DNS array index with a negative number and the cool thing about this is that because of the post incrementation it will move it back to zero so we can repeat this process as often times as we want and we will use a negative number to basically point it to the LC config pointer and then we can use two DNS4 statements to override the LC config pointer and point it anywhere in memory and after that we can use a timer statement with a counter um, and the parser will just try to write it to the LC config structure um, so it will dereference our point and write it there and um, the interval statement will basically write to an uint32 which is followed by the uint where the counter statement is written so we can turn this into a 64-bit write what we are primitive and write anywhere in process memory and um, that gives us then the ability to basically exploit the ASLR bypass um, so this is uh, the main bug of the whole untethered and allows us to basically um, have this primitive and it's also the reason why I decided to give this talk this year and not last year because there the bug was pretty fresh and um, only patched in iOS 12 and it gives the an attacker the ability to exploit zero click more easily because they just need a write where primitive and that's why I held back on it. Um, Sigusa found it after looking um, into Apple's patches of the Corona ASLR bypass and basically from poch 2 gs um, presentation we as a team learned that ASLR is always bypassed um, when a writable region is larger than the maximum slide because then there's always a writable address in process memory and you can uh, used this to brute force the slide um, and Sigusa found out that there was uh, there was also the same problem with the cache in iOS 11 and a few versions of iOS 10 actually. Um, so what's the cache basically? The cache is a pre-compiled um, blob containing all the dynamic linked libraries from Apple. Um, so on each release they just move all of those into one big file um, to optimize load times of apps and um, keep memory pressure low. Um, so it's a pretty big file and um, for that on boot the kernel needs to calculate the slide and slide it in memory. Um, but they only slide it once on boot because it's used in every process. Um, and so Apple defines an area of memory for the cache um, with a base address and a size. And that's hard coded on, on iOS 11. The cache got so big that the maximum slide is now smaller than its data segment. So um, the condition here is satisfy, satisfied and um, ASLR can be bypassed basically. Um, and the weird thing about this is that actually the same thing also happened in iOS 7. Um, back then the size was defined as 500 megabytes and the cache got bigger than 500 megabytes. But before that it was also um, in a few versions possible to to have the same condition that the data segment again was bigger than the maximum slide. And Apple was actually also aware of this because Essa talked about it in one of his talks, um, but they just increased the maximum slide to one gigabyte and didn't add any asserts. And now in iOS 11, it again got so big that the same thing happened. And we believe that they didn't even really notice that uh, up until iOS 12, where the cache was now bigger than one gigabyte, so the kernel just couldn't fit it in the memory region and panicked. And because of that, they just thought, well, then we will increase it to four gigabyte while developing. Um, so we might uh, see this reoccurring in, I don't know, iOS 15 or something like that. Um, exploitation is also pretty simple. Um, we can just brute force the slide now and there are a lot of function pointers in the data segment so uh, we decided to go with platform memmove um, because we can reach it via a str L copy um, 
from the config parser. And the basic strategy behind this is we write a slit ROP chain to an address we can always write to um, uh, for a specific slide ABC. And then we overwrite the platform memmove pointer at its unslit address plus the slide we just chose with a gadget that would pivot um, to our um, slit ROP chain. And then we call strl copy. And now there are basically two possible uh, to possibilities. Either we guess the right slide and then we jump to our gadget and pivot the stack, or uh, we guess the wrong slide but obviously nothing happened because we can just write there. So we can go to back to step one and try again. And then with that we can just brute force the slide till we got the right one. The catch with this, however, is that the write hardware is pretty slow and it also needs a lot of storage. For, so for a 64-bit write, um, I need about 120 bytes um, in the config file. and uh, because there are so many possible slide values, the, um, the chain I have currently um, is around, um, it's only two ROP gadgets, but the config file is already 12 megabytes, I think. And because of that, it takes around 10 seconds to run if it's a really bad slide. So the ROP chain has to be as short as possible. And the other problem is that if uh, we have a bad slide, we will basically smash the whole data segment and we can't really recover from that. So we had crashes in malloc and stuff like that while developing, basically. There are some solutions to that. Uh, we can have a really short ROP chain in stage one, and we can achieve this um, by basically just opening the um, a big cache file to get a file descriptor to it and then we can map it at a static address and uh, then get many gadgets there because the file is obviously code signed by Apple so we can just jump there after mapping it um, but the problem with that is that nothing is set up so malloc and other functions aren't working but as I said earlier the current case has the smash data segment so um, we don't really lose anything and after having the cache at a static address we can use the open and map functions from that cache to basically map stage 2 into the process memory and stage 2 is just a really big rub stack so yeah And then we are basically in ROP, but um, we can only use raw syscalls and not much more because everything else will either use a function that uses malloc or uh, will use malloc on its own. And the other problem is that basically Erno is also broken, so every syscall which fails will crash the binary. So the first thing I do is basically map a few pages um, so that Erno works again because we have a few syscalls that might fail. And then the other big problem is that we now need to implement a whole kernel exploit in ROP. Um, so I started to write a framework around this awesome gadget, um, which is uh, present in all the cache versions I looked at. Uh, basically, at the top, you can see that all the high registers are um, moved into X0 through X7. Um, so all the registers used uh, for the calling convention are. And then we branch link register based on X27. Um, so also high register, and after that we load all the register values back from the stack, so we can just chain those gadgets together to call any functions. We basically drop into the lower half, and then um, chain another one of those afterwards, and then they can load all the um, values, call the function, and then load all the values from the stack again, and that's how the whole ROP chain works. Um, so yeah, I also used another gadget to basically add two registers together, and another one which stores X0 so that I can just store the return value on the stack and later reuse it. And for loops, I use a gadget which just returns if X0 is 0, so it's basically just a red instruction then, and otherwise it will tail call a function using function pointer from the data segment. And because I can control the whole data segment, I can just put a function pointer there um, uh, that will then jump to an epilogue and miss a line the stack with that. And then uh, I can call long jump with two different register values and because of that pivot the stack to um, another location. And uh, when we basically didn't jump outside of the loop, I just emmap the part of stage two, um, which has the loop in it, back over the old stack again and then I can just reuse the stack every time. Um, and then pivot up using long jump. The problem with this, however, is obviously that um, it's pretty slow because I used MAP as a syscall, um, but this can be solved by just unrolling your loops, like for 10 iterations, and then um, mapping the file so that I get a more loop iterations basically per second, which is important for the race. So, um, 
And now we will go over the kernel bugs. So the KSLR leak is uh, CVE 2018-4413 by Panic All. Um, it was fixed in iOS 12.1 and it's luckily reachable from the Raccoon sandbox because Apple is sandboxing most user learn processes and the Raccoon sandbox is really tight. Uh, we didn't have that much many bugs that would work um, in Raccoon, but luckily this one does um, because Raccoon has access to the sysctl functions and, and this one is in the sysctl X function. Um, the progress X function basically allocates a page using KMM alloc, um, but it doesn't zero it, so it might contain old heap data. And then they copy the process arguments to the front of the page. Um, and now if you supply a wrong size from user space, and there are a few other conditions that have to be met, for some weird reason, it copies from the end of the page into user space, which I don't get by this even got through code review. But yeah, as a graphical illustration, there's basically um, this page and this full of uninitialized data, and then they put the process arguments in the front and copy out uninitialized heap data from the back into user land. And we can obviously just spray um, specific heap objects with kernel pointers in them and then um, uh, free them again and use this primitive to maybe leak them. And if we find a kernel pointer in there, we can just calculate this kernel slide. Um, so yeah, and then we come to the RACI double free. Um, as I said, the main problem with the untether is the Raccoon sandbox. So um, many of the kernel bugs that would work in iOS 11 from an app uh, didn't work from Raccoon. But uh, luckily on Halloween, Sparky told me about the light speed bug from Synetic, um, which is reachable from the sandbox. It's a double free in Kellogg 16. So um, the kernel allocator is based on zones and um, with different sizes. So uh, there's, for example, Kellogg 16, and then all objects in that zone have a size of 16 or less bytes, and there are obviously also other zones for uh, bigger objects. And um, basically, there is this structure um, in there that then gets doubled. And so there is the syscall that's handling async file uh, events. So a user mode application can just call it and tell the kernel, hey, please write a buffer to a file and then move on with execution. And it uses a kernel thread to perform those. And for that, it basically allocates a structure to contain some metadata, like where the buffer is and to which file it should write. And the kernel thread obviously has to free the structure um, after it's done because it just gets encoded into the uh, query for the kernel thread, then that wakes up and maybe sees that it has a new job, um, then performs the operation, and then it has to free it, otherwise it would leak. But the problem here is that if an error occurred while setting the structure up, the second field in the structure will be zero, and then um, the structure also isn't encoded into the jobs list, so the kernel thread will never wake up and uh, look at it. So the syscall has to free it because otherwise it will leak. And the problem here is that we can basically reallocate the structure before the syscall checks. So what happens here is that um, the syscall allocates the structure and fills it up, um, and then it gets added to the list. And then the kernel thread is so fast that it runs while the syscall code isn't finished yet, and basically um, gets the gets the job done and frees it, and then we can spray um, all of, we can spray heap the objects pretty fast to overlay with that structure. And then the syscall finishes and checks the field and sees that it's zero, um, because we just replaced it with an object that has zero at that location. And so it frees it again, uh, leading to a double free. And yeah, we can obviously exploit that. So for exploitation, I just um, spam the syscall in one thread. Um, uh, which is pretty hard to do in Rob, but I just um, call thread create with a pointer to long jump and then pivot the stack to that location. Um, and then in the other thread, I spray mach messages with mach port null in, yeah, in it. And um, the thing with mach messages is basically they can be used to um, do inter-process communication, and you can also transfer um, port writes from one process to another. So in this case, we just send an empty port, but you could also place something else there, and that will create an, a structure in Kellogg 16 um, containing zero at that location. And um, then if the mach message gets freed, uh, we can replace it with something and basically point it to somewhere in kernel where a fake um, port structure lives. And when we receive the mach message again, it will um, basically think that this is a real port and treat it as such. And with that, we can create a fake 
kernel task port. Um, so yeah, but for that we obviously need to replace it and um, we need a heap spray and most commonly um, IO surface is used for that as a kernel extension, but because of our sandbox um, we are so limited that we don't have IO surface access. So the question is how we actually spray um, and their root domain user client um, comes to the rescue with um, a memory leak. Um, so Actually, this function secure sleep system options is reachable uh, from the um, Raccoon sandbox and Apple has a way of basically passing data to the kernel via XML. So a user land application can just pass the, um, the XML to the kernel and then they will use this OS unserialized XML function to turn the XML back into C++ objects, which the kernel can then use. And if this sounds dangerous to you, it actually is there. There are a few bugs in that, um, but um, in this case, we basically, this make, just makes sure with the OS dynamic cast that the data, the user mode application supplied is an OS dictionary so that it can use it afterwards. And the problem here is that um, we can basically just supply an OS data object or an OS array. So this OS dynamic cast will fail and unserialized options will become null. Um, but the original pointer returned from OS unserialized XML will get lost. Um, and so we will leak that memory. And yeah, we can just use this for spraying. So then um, about those two primitives I, uh, we use to aid basically exploitation, the case law weakness, um, there are these CTL buffers and they are located in the kernel data region. And because of that, they are split with the same slide as the kernel text region. And this means that as long as we know the um, kernel slide and we already do that from the KSLR leak and we can control the contents of a sysctl buffer and we can get data to a known address um, and we can easily do that with Raccoon because um, it runs as root and so we can just uh, switch out the sysctl buffer and for example place the fake port structure there um, or we later also uh, place place a fake trust structure there, but I will get into that. Um, so yeah, now we can use the primitive to basically spray 10 OS data objects pointing um, to the CCTL buffer, and then we just receive the mach message again and check if the port is not null, and if that's the case, we basically replace the structure. And um, then for the non-SMAP version, we can even get the case like by traversing a few um, pointers, but that's not needed for the SMAP version because there we already got it with the case leak. Um, but yeah, on non-SMAP devices, we also don't need the CCTL buffers because we can just place the fake port structure in user land and um, then we get the kernel slide this way. And with the kernel slide and this fake port, we can create a fake user client and from there we can create a call primitive. And um, then we can use this to override the BSS trust cache pointer and point it to a buffer with two hashes um, for stage three and stage four. So basically, Apple has two ways of doing code signing. Either it has a user land daemon that verifies um, third party applications, or it has this tr so called trust cache, which is a list of hashes from all of their system applications. And as soon as a process is spawned or a dynamically uh, linked library is loaded, um, they will basically first verify if the hash of that file is inside of the trust cache and if so they will just trust the binary blindly because it comes from Apple basically and now when we override this uh, trust cache point and point it to our um, buffer we can basically place the hash of stage 3 and 4 there and then the system will think those are Apple binaries and we can just load them. So. Um, yeah, and for that we need to use the ghetto DL open. We can't use the real DL open because that uses malloc. So we just open stage three um, to get a file descriptor. Then we attach the signature, um, which now succeeds as the hashes and trust cache. And then we can map it as uh, read, execute, and jump there. And then we are, after two months of um, writing drop chains, we are finally in C and um, we can write code more easily. And um, the problem there is that we still don't have a working cache, so we are still limited um, to the basic functionality. And because of the ghetto DL open linking is obviously not working. Um, so we just rely on raw assembly for the syscalls. And I also pass some function pointers, uh, which I already use for stage two. So for example, um, open and mmap to uh, stage three. Um, from there, we remap the kernel task and stash it into our special port four so that other user mode applications can use it. And um, then, we can basically escape the sandbox by zeroing the sandbox label in the process structure. Um, so that we can launch a new binary 
um, because otherwise the raccoon sandbox doesn't allow it, but um, in the kernel, those process structures basically have this label which um, tells the kernel which sandbox to use, and by zeroing it, you can just tell it to not use any sandbox. And um, then we can launch stage three, uh, four, and with that, get a working cache back. And um, that's the big advantage from like having um, a separate file. We now have the full cache functions working and can um, do work more easily. And then I, it's just a call to POSIX spawn and then a raw exit syscall to exit the daemon without crashing because if launchd would see that one of the launch daemons crashed um, and the specific flag it said it would try to restart it and then our rob chain would run again. We obviously want to prevent that so uh, we use um, the exit syscall to exit it cleanly. And then we are in stage four. And from my side, that was just basically to block all signals so we don't get killed by launch D. Because when launch D sees that the launch team and exits, it will send a sick kill to all its child process. And I need to catch that, otherwise, stage four would get killed. And then I just called the post exploitation framework, which was written by Sparky. And basically, that does the following it first elevates the process to root with um, kernel credentials, then it performs a remount of the root file system because on stock iOS, the root file system is mounted as read only, and um, we obviously uh, need to mount it as read write to uh, modify some files on there, and then it, set non it sets the nonce um, so that the user might be able to downgrade to an older version if they have blobs, uh, verifies that the bootstrap is in place from the installation, and then injects substrate, so the framework that's used for um, to perform tweak injection and it's plugging into the trust cast and uh, starts them so that they can start to inject into newly spawned processes. Then it spawns all the launch demons associated with the jailbreak, um, unloads our own demons so that um, we don't respawn it by accident and run the kernel exploit again, and then performs an LD restart um, to basically restart all of the launch teams of the system so that Substrate can inject tweaks to them and with that the system is fully jailbroken and uh, we can perform a few cl uh, cleanup steps. But yeah, basically the end user has a jailbroken system then. As a little side note, um, while we were testing all the demons, we got killed by Jetsam a lot. Uh, so basically, Jetsam is this kernel extension uh, from Apple that is there for memory management um, and they basically want to make sure that the user mode application doesn't use too much memory um, because they don't have that much on an iPhone uh, or all the iPhones actually. So there um, is this list and um, Jetsam, if Jetsam sees that the user and process uses more memory than it should use, it will just kill it. Um, so we changed the values in the plist and the launch demons um, to actually allow the launch demons to use more memory. Um, but the weird thing about this is that this actually got accepted by Jetsam and we had no more crashes, while Apple um, actually tried to mitigate that beforehand. So. Um, because jailbreakers always would modify those um, configuration files on the launch demons, they started to move all of them into a dynamic library uh, to guard them under code signing so that jailbreakers couldn't change them anymore. Um, but uh, when we tried to figure out the launch demon, uh, the launch order of demons, we dumped that develop, and um, uh, there was also a plist embedded for uh, Jetsam, but Apple was still using um, those files on disk, so I really want to look further into this because it seems like Apple um, isn't always ignoring those configuration files on disk. And yeah, then um, thanks to the whole team, Sigusa, Sparky, and Stack, uh, for bouncing ideas back and forth and writing um, the remaining part of the jailbreak. Then for Poch2G and Synetic for um, the kernel bugs. Um, uh, and basically also a big thanks to Zorik for Substrate and the whole jailbreaking framework and for Swagger Parrot Geek and Smackers and Ninja for testing a few things and keeping me motivated. And for Jonathan Levin um, for his books basically because he bought a few awesome books about iOS and that got me into it two years ago. Um, and yeah. And in the future, I think um, exploiting kernel vulnerability without the cache functions and only in ROB really is a pain and I probably won't do it again um, uh, because I spent months with that. But um, yeah, the other big problem now is that with A12, so um, the newer iPhones, um, Hack, so point authentication kills most of these types of exploits because the problem there is that you would now need an ASLR bypass and the pack bypass to um, get into return-oriented programming. And um, 
it's pretty unlikely to basically have both um, uh, because pack bypasses are even really rare and yeah I only know about this one ASLR bypass um, so yeah you would have to get pretty lucky also untethering gets progressively harder Apple um, just fixed another good idea I had in iOS 13.1 um, basically the idea was to use printf uh, with the format uh, string format modifier percentage n to uh, get a Turing complete machine because printf with this modifier is basically Turing complete um, and then use that to um, develop a pack bypass basically and get into ROP um, but now we're in iOS 13.1 I think uh, Apple actually removed the percentage n modifier so you can no longer do this um, and yeah so this idea is also gone and yeah in the end I was able to complete my pipe dream so I I guess I will need a new one. Um, so watch out, Apple. And that's Spice. Um, are there any questions? Thank you, little Lilo, for his fantastic work. You, uh, I suppose we're going to hear more from you in the future. Maybe. I'm let's pretty see. sure. <laughs> are there questions here in this audience? No one who wants to... Hire this guy now, right away. <laughs> no one. No one. Can you describe me what changed actually two times in these, uh, you know, all the OS X, uh, uh, OES versions? What they changed to make yeah, this what, not possible? You know, I, I told you, like, I started uh, the tethering challenge actually at yeah. 5.1. Well, they added a lot new mitigations and also obviously patched a few bugs, like for example those ASLR bypasses that um, Porch2G used in Corona got patched. Um, and this one also now got patched by accident. Um, but yeah, I mean, like some bugs are still there. For example, the, the bug in Raccoon, the config bars, the bug is still in all day. But yeah, I don't really care about it. And uh, the kernel bugs um, got patched by Apple. but. For example, the Synetic one, they also, also patched wrong by accident, and now it always leaked the struct, but I think they also fixed that now. Uh, the, your team, you, you're mentioning your team, you're working yeah. you're not on your own, of course. No. Uh, and uh, how are you structured? Uh, how are the roles uh, divided? How is the... Well, we are just like four people, so, and we have this group chat, and then we are just hanging out there and bouncing ideas back and forth, and maybe working on some stuff. And, and close contact with the Apple developers? Uh, no, not at all. Nothing? <laughs> no. More. No, I mean, I, I reported one bug to their bounty once, um, or like actually just to them, not their bounty um, and that one got fixed and it was all fine uh, but yeah for now I uh, don't report bugs at the moment if you have time you have time left now actually you're looking for a new project isn't it yeah yeah and I might ah. report some of those bugs in the meantime but I mean with the presentation they also know about them now so they might fix them they will be listening now then at least probably I yeah. hope yeah <laughs> uh, is there anyone who has really a Sit, he was sitting on a question here. None of you. It's already noon, you know, noon past, so could be that none of you. You can ask them something. Maybe someone wants <laughs> to help. Ask, you ask them something. Maybe they can help you out with certain challenges that are there. Well, I, I don't really have a question either. I, <laughs> I, I have my own research project now um, ah. where, like, I. I do stuff at the moment and look at other things. For example, the, the boot ROM exploit came out now, and so I um, yeah started developing on the check rain team with them, and that's what I currently do, basically. You're great, man. Little Lilo, thank you. <laughs> Give him a warm applause.